I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, we, uh, we know it's been uh, you know, quite a long day and uh, we appreciate you coming out to learn as much as possible about uh, the to this, this very, very important topic. And I, uh, and I always, always at these conventions um, believe that the, the, the gap of knowledge uh, gets you know, narrower and narrower as we come up to the stage, as we uh, uh, speak to our audience, as we meet our audience members back at our uh, booth and try to help with this complex topic. So uh, we all understand as Muslims uh, uh, how impermissible riba is, but I think a lot of us aren't necessarily educated on uh, how riba is formulated in, in financial transactions and where it may be a, you know, present and where it may not be present. And so today, one of the things we'll cover is that you'll get uh, a good amount of information, inshallah, before this session is done. We'll go ahead and hold our questions until the end of the session. Um, and don't feel like uh, your questions won't be answered. Believe me, we'll be here after the session, um, either up here or outside the hall um, to make sure everyone has answers to whatever questions they may have. Um, or, uh, or, you can follow us to the booth even if you'd like and continue the conversation. Um, my name is Hussam Qutub. I am uh, the Senior Vice President uh, for Guidance Residential. I've been with the organization since 2003. Um, I remember the year prior in 2002 actually coming to my first ISNA convention. It was in Washington DC at the time. And this organization that I'm a part of now had just been formulated and it had just presented its, uh, its Sharia compliant program to the public. At that time, it was in three states, um, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and New Jersey. Today, alhamdulillah, we're, we're much more uh, accessible to many, many more Muslims across the US. What you'll hear is a little background about our uncompromising path to providing this program to American Muslims. I say uncompromising because it truly was, and a lot of people don't realize this, but it truly was, a major undertaking for our organization to bring this program to life and to actually bring it to Muslims across the US. And you'll see what I mean by that very, very shortly. So we'll cover the history of, of that journey. Understanding riba, which I mentioned, is gonna be very, very important to all. And then how the program actually works and then we'll open it up for question and answer. Um, the company that made all this possible, uh, it was a company that was formulated 50 years ago, or now almost 60 years ago. It's called Capital Guidance. Um, it's an international investment company. Didn't start off that way. It started off as a very small mom and pop, um, Muslim owned, Muslim families coming together from the Middle East uh, who set foot here in the United States and began growing their small business of really just creating businesses that bring value to humanity and there's, um, quite a bit of extensive global um, experience in that today. Um, and with their, their global diversified portfolio of financial investments today um, has us literally in, in, in 70, 77 offices around the world. Capital Guidance, one of the uh, individuals who founded it um, was his name is, his name is Dr. Abdul Ghafoor Hamour. Um, and he had uh, two sons. One of them was Dr. Muhammad Hamour, who was a manager, managing director of Capital Guidance. It was Dr. Muhammad Hamour and his vision uh, back in 1998, 1999, that sparked the idea uh, and the formation of Guidance Financial Group and Guidance Residential. Um, and as you can see from this uh, org chart, uh, you'll see Guidance Residential kind of be a subsidiary of Guidance Financial Group, who's a subsidiary of Capital Guidance. Um, we have a sister company, we have a number of sister companies. One of them is Guidance Home Services. For all of those here that might be real estate agents, that might be appealing to, to you and, and your business. And I'll introduce a gentleman here with us who is the uh, vice president of that organization. His name is Adam and say it, he's sitting there, his hands, he'll wave. Um, you'll, you'll get to be able to interact better with our organization and helping Muslims if you actually work with Adam. 
Um, we also have guidance securities, guidance mutual, guidance investments. Now, um, guidance investments has made the biggest impact on Islamic finance from an institutional finance perspective versus a retail finance perspective. And they are headquartered out of Kuala Lumpur, uh, originally here in, in Washington, D.C., uh, but uh, moved to Kuala Lumpur and has done great things over those years. This is, this is kind of the, 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 the global footprint of our, of our parent company. Like I said, 77 offices in 27 countries, operations uh, entailing international financial services, investment management, real estate, luxury home products, global industrial services. Many things that if you were to look deeply at, uh, I think we could all be proud of as Muslims in terms of the achievements that this organization has made in these last 50, 60 years. But the achievement in Islamic finance, the achievement in Islamic finance, that's about 20 years in the making. Um, and that was in 2002 with the launch of, of, of Guidance Financial Group. And it's incredible to me that in a span of 20 years, this institution has made a mark here in the United States made a mark in Asia, in the Middle East, and North Africa. You may see a couple of other logos there on the screen, one of them being Dar al-Tamlik. Dar al-Tamlik was formed in 2007 after the success we had here in, in actually creating the first ever Islamic home financing institution that was not a bank and not a subsidiary of a bank. Those are important, I'll cover those a little later. Uh, but that innovation sp sparked interest in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and they approached us in 2006 about creating the first ever standalone mortgage company for the Kingdom. And we worked with them as a technical advisor, investor, to help launch this organization, Dar al-Tamlik, which today is the largest uh, home financing company in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, you'll see another one, uh, another logo there, Shaza. Shaza is a luxury hotel brand. Uh, it was made possible because of a hospitality fund that Guidance Financial Group created. Um, this hospitality fund was intended to attract Muslim institutional investors who wanted to invest in the hospitality industry, but couldn't because the hospitality industry traditionally has pork, alcohol, revenues from those uh, impermissible uh, uh, endeavors. And, and so they wouldn't have a, a, a venue essentially to invest until Guidance Financial Group established uh, the Shaza Hospitality Fund first, which then launched in, 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 in collaboration with Kapensky Hoteliers, the premier hotel, hotel brand in the world, to create this brand that uh, essentially celebrated the, the spirit of the East, the Silk Route, the Islamic Empire, everything that was uh, uh, made possible in, in those ages as, as a way to attract individuals to this type of hotel where those can be showcased. And this hotel today, if you've gone out to Medina al mukarrama or, 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 or Mecca, you'll see it because it's actually the, one of the closest hotels to the Haram. Um, this was made possible because of Guidance Financial Group's efforts in Islamic finance. Um, I, I won't bore you, but we, we actually helped convert the second largest um, riba-based bank in Morocco to an Islamic bank. That was a project that we worked on as well. Um, and the only other two institutions was Qatar Islamic Bank and Islamic Development Bank that worked on the first and the third hot, uh, bank in Morocco because they were looking to transform the top three banks into Islamic banks. And that was a bit of an achievement that you don't really hear about any of these things here in the United States. But, um, but I think it's, it's well worth uh, uh, it to share with, with audiences. Um, Guidance Financial Group, um, essentially, I would call it the innovator in global Islamic finance. Uh, wherever things were impossible, we kind of pushed the envelope and made impossible. Um, by all means, this was not something that any, any other institution was willing to take these risks. We have. Uh, we've had a very patient and very um, understanding leadership team in our parent company. 
because they cared about the subject matter. This was an important thing to all of them. Um, and so international finance, investment management, capital markets, Sharia structuring and placement, these are the things that they've been focused on globally over these last 20 years. Uh, locally, we've been focused on helping Muslims achieve the, achieve the dream of home ownership uh, without compromising an iota of their principles and values. Um, the work that Guidance Residential has done today is gonna to be on display here and you'll understand how uh, three years, three years and a multi-million dollar research and development budget injected in 1999 by capital guidance through Guidance Financial Group to establish this, this alternative mortgage. Um, that impact has had tremendous uh, uh, positive results over these years. That work involved eight, no less than 18 law firms. 18 law firms here in the United States over three years noodling their way through all kinds of federal and state regulatory uh, constraints that essentially force institutions to lend money because that's the platform. That's Western economics and that's how it works. And for us, it took those 18 law firms, a multi-million dollar R&D budget, and at the time, six of the world's leading Islamic financial transaction law scholars. If you were to pick the top leading scholars on earth in Islamic financial transaction laws, they were on our board to get this project off the ground. Um, and the result of all of that work created what's called the Declining Balance Co-ownership Program that has not changed since April 2002 when it launched. Many, many say this is the greatest innovation in the US uh, housing industry for the last 30, 40 years. Today, this is, this is where guidance is. Uh, 34 states, $10 billion in financing provided um, since inception. Um, over 35,000 uh, Muslim American families and some non-Muslims actually served with this program. I say non-Muslims because some have heard about the actual consumer-friendly benefits of the program and wondered, why would I go with a conventional mortgage if this is actually more fair and equitable? Um, this is a, a bit of a rundown of the history that I just went over with everybody, um, beginning with 1999 and that effort. Um, the, miles, the first mi major milestone we actually crossed was in 2007 where we actually achieved our first billion dollars since inception. Now think about that. That, that was around, to, between 2007, 2009, what was happening in the US economy? Crash. We had a crash, a major crash if you remember it. Um, and that crash was caused by housing. That, that crash actually originated in the housing industry, housing finance industry. Well that was, those were the years we had some of our best um, uh, production and volume uh, since inception. We were unscathed coming through that because we didn't dabble in anything that was high risk and um, riba based. Um, we, we got a lot of attention for that back then. A lot of the media attention that you see today about guidance and Islamic home finance actually originated from 2008, 2009. Um, we learned, Isna actually told us, you know, you guys are one of the biggest corporate supporters, if not the biggest corporate supporters of uh, nonprofit uh, Muslim American institutions. Well, it, it's actually very true. Uh, back in 2012, we had provided over half, one and a half million dollars back to the community um, uh, through activities with massages, Islamic schools, and national institutions. And today, that's more than doubled, and I will say, when you have an Islamic finance institution in the community, uh, a for-profit corporation dedicated to Islamic finance, you, you essentially have created a pillar in the community that wasn't there before, that, that actually helps and contributes to the community beyond just providing their services, but through philanthropic efforts and, um, and community engagement, which we did not have. I don't think you ever, we've ever seen uh, any major bank come out and help ISNA or ICNA or MASS or any institution for that matter, um, because that's not their goal. 
Um, this is the exposure we received in 2009 and beyond from all the major outlets. We've even been um, recognized and uh, awarded some prestigious awards, I would say. Uh, the, the Housing Wire, the V there, the Housing Wire Vanguard Award is the trade press for the entire US housing industry. It is where all major housing professionals go to read information about the latest uh, in housing. And they actually recognized our CEO and our organization a couple years ago as a vanguard in the, in, in the housing industry, something very rare uh, to be actually um, considered for. We were also recognized by Freddie Mac, uh, someone who we've been working with since 2002, and I'll go into the Freddie Mac relationship because a lot of you, uh, I'm just gonna assume this, a lot of you don't know what Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae do, and there's assumptions that have been kind of made since 2002, because I've been here that long and I've heard them, that they lend money, and that's haram to work with them, and that, that's not, those aren't the facts. So we'll go into that as well. But they've awarded us the RISE Award because we've opened the door to home ownership for a segment of the community that was underserved, and that's their charter. Um, and then recognized by World Finance Magazine as best Islamic home finance provider. Um, in 2014, we were um, looked at very closely by the Assembly of uh, Muslim Jurists of America. This is uh, a group, it's called Amja that represents about 375 American Muslim Imams in all across the United States. Uh, they have a fatwa issuing committee and such. They did a thorough analysis of our program against other programs. And what they found was guidance is actually the most permissible, the most, per most authentically structured mortgage program in the United States today. Um, none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And I will tell you, the, the assembly of the following scholars that I'll introduce to you because they really made the difference for us. The six scholars that I originally mentioned at the top of the hour that were brought together over those three years to develop this program, all of them are either current members or former members of an organization called IOFI. You should know what IOFI is because IOFI is the, the only standard setting institution for Islamic finance globally. So if central banks of nations wants to establish an economy based on Islamic finance, they would go to IOFI to help them understand how to do that. IOFI sets those standards for central banks and for companies, corporations, who want to learn and understand how they can reconfigure their institutions. Uh, it's, 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 it's up there, it's the account, I know it's a mouthful, so it's the Accounting and Auditing Organization of Islamic Financial Institutions. They're based out of Bahrain. That's where they're based out of. The chairman of their Sharia Supervisory Board is none other, th none other than uh, Sheikh uh, Mufti Muhammad Taqi Uthmani, who happens to be the chairman of Guidance's Independent Sharia Supervisory Board, who was one of the first who came part of the, the six that helped create this program. Uh, in, in addition to Dr. Imran Ashraf Osmani, Dr. Muhammad El Ghari from Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Yusuf Talad Lorenzo, who was originally in, in, in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and now the United States, Dr. Abdul Sattar Bhudda, Rahimallah Anno, who just passed recently from Syria, Sheikh Nidam Yaqubi out of Bahrain, and Dr. Muhammad Dawood Bakr from Malaysia. This is Guidance's Independent Sharia Supervisory Board. Uh, we cannot change any iota of our contracts, letters, or anything without their assessment, review, and approval. The fatawas about our program were published back in 2002. They still stand today. Um, and you have access to them on our website. We, we invite you to go and, and, and review them. Now we're gonna get into riba and our deen and what it states about riba. I think we all understand very clearly that riba is haram, plain and simple. In the Quran, uh, in, in, in Surah 2, Ayah 275, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, those who take unlawful interest will stand before God on the day of judgment as those whose minds have been corrupted by the influence of Satan. Because they say that commerce is just like interest, riba. But Allah says, 
He's made commerce lawful and he's forbidden interest. This is a powerful um, section in the Quran, I'll tell you why. Because even during the time of the Prophet وسلم, people didn't understand the difference between commerce and riba. There was still vague understanding and co confusion about what constituted riba and what didn't. This was the case even before the Prophet وسلم. It wasn't Islam that forbade riba. It was even in the ch early chapters of uh, the Bible, in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus, and in Exodus. And if you look at Exodus, for example, if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not be like a money lender, charge him no interest. The issue of money lending has really been corrupted over these last few centuries. Money lenders use the excuse that they're there to help people, which is what they are to do, there to do, is to really help those who need help. So there's a charitable purpose there. But what they've done is they've used that charitable purpose and moved it into trade, which is forbidden. Trade has its contracts and charity, a charitable act has its contracts and the lender agreement has its place in only one. The lender agreement is there for charitable purposes. So we'll go into a little bit of that because that's a, a, something that I want everybody to kind of begin thinking about. Uh, because riba itself is profit collected or paid out on a loan agreement or a loan transaction. That's riba. Riba is the creation of profit from nothing. Who can create something from nothing? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so those who have the means here on earth cannot play God, cannot start creating something from nothing by simply saying, here's a hundred dollars, I'll sell it to you for two hundred dollars. That's what is that really saying? I'm creating a hundred dollars from doing nothing except selling my currency for a higher amount and veiling it as a loan. Riba is strictly prohibited in all monotheistic faiths. We talked about that. And um, it's funny because we, we've actually run across some churches out in Texas, for example, in one of the 34 states we operated that have come to us asking to finance their homes using us. And we've had transactions with them. What is permissible? So remember, Islam isn't one that just bans. Our deen is not one that just simply bans things, right? Um, our deen has solutions and solutions that are timeless. So charging a fee on usage of an asset, that's permissible. Buying and selling an asset or a portion of an asset, that is permissible. And profiting from ownership in a permissible revenue generating arrangement, that is permissible. So all of these three are permissible activities. And you have to understand they're all tied to what? A lot of them are tied to assets. Uh, they're all tied to some sort of an asset. Remember I mentioned earlier the hotel venture that we went into? That generates revenue. As long as that revenue is halal, that's fine. We could sell shares of that hotel to any willing investor at that point who cares about the revenue generating arrangements and that they're halal. Uh, charging a fee on the usage of an asset. I can charge a fee for you to use you know, my, my, my vehicle, right? That's an ijara, and we'll, we'll go into some of these. Here they are actually, the Sharia compliant contracts that are permissible. You will not see lending on here. So the first is murabaha, which is a purchase and resale of something. So I can tomorrow buy a vehicle for $5,000. I can refurbish it, fix it, whatever I need to do to increase its value. And let's say I put $1,000 into that vehicle to improve it. So now my cash output is 6,000, but I can sell it to the public for anything I want above six. I could sell it for 10 if I wanted to, as long as there's a willing buyer. That is murabaha. If the person who I sell it to says to me, Hussam, can I buy it on installment? That is permissible, as long as we understood that it's okay. You're gonna agree to buy it for 10,000, you'll pay me, 
$1,000 a month for 10 months. That's agreeable. Okay, because I've already, we've already identified where my profit's coming from, right? It's not lending money or anything of that nature. Um, Musharaka, Musharaka, we're gonna go deep, deep into it. It's very important that everybody here understands it. But before I do, I'm gonna talk about Ijara. Ijara is, is simply a lease. How many of you lease a vehicle? Raise your hand. Okay, so those of you who raised your hand, you've signed an Ijara contract. <laughs> you just didn't know it. That's an Ijara. Um, you could lease anything. You could lease uh, equipment. You could lease uh, um, vehicles, of course, and uh, uh, apartments and so on and so forth, right? But Musharaka, let's go back to Musharaka. Musharaka is partnership. So most of the time, if you heard the word partnership, what does your mind go to right away? Well, of course, like my uncle, he went in, you know, partnership with uh, my father and they bought a gas station, bought a supermarket, bought this, a restaurant. And that's a musharaka. I know exactly what that is. That is a traditional musharaka. That is a specific kind of musharaka that has a name. It's called shirakat al-aqad. That is a musharaka for joint venture. So there's a difference. That's why I'm making this distinction. Uh, shirakat al-aqad is where we would go in on that, let's say that restaurant, okay? And I bring in 60% of the cost, you bring in 40%, we decide we're gonna move into this, we love to cook, we love to feed people, and any th revenue that's generated from that restaurant, after expenses, gets split 60, 40, okay? If we sell the restaurant in the future, guess what? 60, 40. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Shirakat al-Aqad. Um, you can also use Shirakat al-Aqad under Shirakat al-A'mal, for example, partnership and services. So we start a consulting company, same thing. I bring 60% of the expenses related to, the, to, the, to running the, uh, the consulting firm and so on and so forth. You get the idea. That's not guidance's structure. I just wanna clarify that. That is not the structure our Sharia supervisory board our, our, our business folks, our lawyers, that's not what three years created. Shirakat al-Milk was the route that our Sharia Supervisory Board decided is the proper route for housing financing in the United States. I'm gonna go into what that looks like. Shirakat al-Milk is joint ownership, and there's two types, there's optional, there's compulsory. I'm gonna go through the, the compulsory first, because all of you will know what this is. So, shirakat al-milk is when, and the compulsory version of it, is when a, uh, a parent passes away and their assets get inherited by the children, okay? Now, all of a sudden, in that one instant, the children become partners in ownership of those assets. And the children have to decide what do they wanna do? Uh, it could very well be the case where you inherit uh, a residence, a home. One of the children might be already owning a home and living fine, while the other says, I'm going to move into this. But if we're, let's say, 50-50, one will probably say, can you buy me out to their sibling? And an arrangement will take place, okay? This is the core of the thought behind the structuring of our Decline and Balance Co-ownership Program, is Shirakat al-Milk because I said this is compulsory when at, the, at, at the passing of a person and the inheritance deems the partners to be the inheritors. In the optional version, it introduces essentially an option for people to go together into partnership of an asset to facilitate the ultimate final ownership of one of the parties, okay? And that is a process and it's, it's a contractual process. And Shirakat al-Milk is the basis for Guidance's Declining Balance Co-Ownership Program, and you'll see how that, that works its way through all of the regulatory, all of the logical and illogical things that you may come across here in the United States. Um, I'm gonna play a video in hopes that it, you will be able to hear the audio because I think it's a little bit separate from um, what we have, but I think this video will give you a quick synopsis of what we're referring to. I 
I had a few. I had a feeling the audio wasn't going to work <laughs> based on our audio issues earlier, so that's okay. Um, this video and any other video that I'll show you is on our website, so I want you to know. We have a, a, a YouTube page. Uh, um, I, I don't even know if we have a TikTok page. We do. We do have a TikTok page. <laughs> uh, so um, so uh, at the end of the day, you'll benefit from watching these videos. They're very short. They're concise. We've learned long ago that uh, attention spans have to be shorter, maybe not TikTok shorter, but at least two minutes short, three minutes short to learn from these kinds of things. Um, but this, th this, will, this will describe what the video says. So in our program, in our, in our ag agreement, we have essentially a co-owner and a buyer. We are the co-owner, the customer is the buyer. And um, the home buyer in this sense and guidance agree to be co-owners in a property that's identified. Identified by who? The buyer. Only the buyer identifies the property. We have nothing to do with identification of the property. It's your choice, okay? Uh, ownership is established at whatever level of, of funding is provided. So it could be 80-20, uh, 50-50, could go up to 95-5, even in some cases 90, 90 yeah, uh, 97-3. Um, and so that determines your ownership at the, the, the point of the transaction, the purchase. Through monthly payments that are established now, either on a term of 30, 15, or 20, remember, this is very similar to what you're seeing out in the marketplace. So the, the terms, we fit them to match what's out there today. So there's a correlation and a comparison. Monthly payments are then made up of two portions. So whether it's a monthly payment fixed for 30 years, 15, or 20, they're made up of two portions. One is called the acquisition amount. And what do you think the acquisition amount does? Acquires our share. And you're obligated at that point to acquire our share because we're bringing this, these funds to help facilitate home ownership. So you're acquiring our funds, or, or, or our ownership in the property, and at the same time you're paying a utilization fee. That utilization fee represents the part of the property you don't yet own, but we've given you exclusive use and enjoyment of. So, we're co-owning, let's say 90-10. We own 90% of the property, you own 10. And at that point, we begin the acquisition process. You're paying monthly payments, and you're living in 100% of the property. You're not living in 10% of it. You're living in 100% of it. So we would then, as part of your monthly payment through these 30-year, 10-year, 20, 15, terms, you will be paying to buy our share out and pay for the 90% of the property that you're using that you don't yet own. Guess what? Every month, we're owning less. We don't own 90 after the first payment. It actually reduces below 90. You're, you're owning more. And so what happens to the monthly payment? The portion on utilization decreases every month. Every month, it decreases. But the portion on acquisition fills that void and you're acquiring at a faster pace. So at any point in time, you can say, guidance, that's it. I don't wanna be your partner anymore, I'm gonna write you a check and buy you out, and that's fine. The goal at the end of the day is for you to become the sole owner of the property. What does a conventional bank do? So those of you who have bought homes in the past and used conventional banking products and such, well, you're dealing with a lender, plain and simple and you have now become a borrower. So the borrower arranges what is a loan from that bank according to a fixed or floating interest rate. You're, you're now, once you sign those, that, and by the way, I know uh, uh, some of you who've gone to a closing or settlement, it's, it's a stack of papers about this high, right, at the settlement table, and you're signing, 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 eventually probably sore from signing, you, you, you're only really signing one very important document in all of those. The majority of those are disclosures, but the one important document that the bank will make you sign, it's called the lender agreement. That's the title. If you have a conventional mortgage, go look, go look at those stacks. Find the one in, that's hidden in the middle. It's called the lender agreement. That is the loan. And it's about, I don't know, four or five pages but that establishes you now as a borrower 
and establishes them, them as clear as day as the lender. This is important because all of a sudden the relationship between the two is characterized in such a way that now the creation of riba begins because you're not just repaying the loan because you're a, a, a borrower, you're going to repay more. So the borrower purchases the home. You, so you purchase the home. You make those monthly payments that are interest on the money lent and the principal on the loan. And over the course of the loan, you repay your debt in full. So I have another video that's not gonna play, but I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, here's what this describes to you. This, this, this is a very powerful video about why we're not a bank. And I will tell you, uh, many people come to us and say, why didn't you just establish, get, get a bank charter? Why didn't you get a bank charter back in 2002 and make your lives and everybody's lives very easier? I will tell you right now, that was, that was proposed a number of times. Uh, remember the 18 law firms that I said we worked with in between 1999 and 2002? Those law firms kept coming back to us and saying, we have a shortcut for you. We have a great solution for you. Go out and get a bank charter from any state. Because if you get the bank charter, your licensing process to get into other states is going to be easier. The licensing of your, uh, uh, of your staff is going to be easier. Oh, and guess what? You'll be able to take deposits and even borrow from the Fed window, borrow cash from the Fed window, to be able to leverage against your mortgages. And we said, wait a minute. You're, you're telling us to basically do what we're out to not do. And they're like, no, 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 you can still, you, you know, create a, a, um, a musharaka structure, but keep it separate, keep it away from everything else. <laughs> we said, I'm sorry, um, how, it's not like we're trying to take advantage of the Muslim community and make money from riba, we're trying to eliminate it, eradicate it, completely do without it within our entire organization from top to bottom. And so that's not gonna be an option. Please don't recommend these options to us in the future. And let's go the harder route, the more difficult route. So banks in the United States, and this is for education purposes, their job is to take deposits. They gladly take your deposits, but their job is to take those deposits and circulate them out. And how do they circulate them out of the bank? through loans, different types of loans, starting with credit cards, uh, vehicle loans, uh, personal loans, student loans, um, mortgages, home loans, home equity line of credits. I can keep going and on and on. So money comes in, in the form of deposits, and they lend them out. Besides the most important violation of Islam, which is riba, there's also a secondary violation, a major one as well. They are prohibited from discriminating against who the borrower is. So they are prohibited from discriminating against who the borrower is. So when they do this, and let's say it's a business loan, because they do business loans, they have to do business loans. When they do business loans, what kind of businesses are coming to the banks? Anything, correct? So what do you have? You have the uh, alcohol beverage control company coming, the liquor store. You have companies that sell gladly pork. They focus on pork products. And you have everything else in between. And what happens to that community now where that bank is there in the middle of the community? If you were living in that community, you'd probably have an, you, you'd have an opinion. I'm sure you would. Please don't fund these things because they're gonna corrupt our society, one. Number two, I don't want my deposits going to those kinds of things. Because now I'm what? Indirectly supporting those causes. That's why many Muslims don't take interest on their savings from banks. I, one, do not, and I tell you, I get a weird look every time I go to deposit anything 
because somebody will come out to talk to me and say, you're not taking advantage of our great, uh, uh, you know, 2% return or 3%. I said, keep it. I don't want it. It's fine. And they wonder. <laughs> so, but here, this is a major issue because we can't live without banks. We can't put our money in the mattress, under the pillow. It's not safe. That's recognized. But we can choose who we finance our homes with. Because if you are financing from an institution that says, maybe I'm supporting or, or providing Islamic, an Islamic product, such as, you know, Murabaha uh, 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 or Musharaka, um, the question should be, yeah, but what else are you doing? Because I need to understand the ecosystem that you're actually prol proliferating. And so what this video does is help you understand that the differentiator with our organization, for those of you who are here in the very beginning and understood our goal on a global level, um, that's not something we're gonna be oper operating in regardless of anything that happens in the market today. We will never move in that direction. And that's just our charter. Um, our Musharaka structures you'll see in this video are ones where for every single Musharaka Mutanakasa structured mortgage we actually have, we establish a limited liability company, an LLC for that specific Musharaka. We do that because we wanted to take the extra, the extra security in making sure that this is formed as a, par a true partnership and that there are protections for our, for our homeowners in case we get sued and vice versa. Those are real serious protections and they actually solidify the Musharaka. No other institution will do that and no other institution will share in some of the risks that I'll go over with you guys right now. Benefits. There are, these come from, and some of these come out of risks, risk that occurs. So first there's a cap late payment fee, and this one is not about a risk. This one's just about the banks wanting more. When you're late making your mortgage company with B of A or whoever, it's very simple. They will charge you 5% on your payment as a late fee. 5%. You can do the math. If you have a higher mortgage payment, you're gonna pay hundreds of dollars in late fees. Be late two months, it compounds. Three months, the compounding just gets even better for them. And they actually project every year when they're building their budgets and their P&Ls, banks actually have in their P&L a line item that says, we will generate income next year. We will look forward to generating income next year, right here from people being late. And we will earn not just revenue, but actual, because there's not a whole lot that they're doing. We're gonna, we're gonna earn income. It's gonna hit the bottom line when people are late. We can't wait. Um, guidance is, is forbidden, has never, won't ever charge a percentage of that payment. We do charge a late fee, and I'll explain how that's calculated because that's where it gets important. When the consumer uh, is late making a payment, they are not meeting their obligation, it's clear. But are they causing us any inconvenience of any sort? And the, uh, this was a discussion that was had with the Sharia Supervisory Board members during the time when we were developing this. And the, and the answer was this. Well, we actually by law have to do something. What is it that guidance has to do? Guidance has to actually send out in the mail a reminder, uh, a late payment reminder. And by law, not only do we need to send that out, we actually have to make a call. Okay, so the Sharia Supervisory Board said, then you're disadvantaged financially by doing that because uh, the people who are doing that for you, you have to pay them, correct? So of course we have to pay them. And they said, well then you can recoup whatever you're financially disadvantaged and only that when you're uh, reminding people of, of being late. And we said, well, what is that amount? They said, go figure it out. <laughs> so what we did is we hired a research group to literally work on how much does it cost a company like us when somebody is late and we have to remind them. This research paper was done back in 2001 and it highlighted what the cost, the human cost, because we have to pay people. It's a collections department that we have to go out and engage. 
it came out to be around $50, okay? For a company that's, you know, I, if I had to put it by states, uh, I would say probably 15 states, okay? Well, so we're at 34 states, it's $50 today. It doesn't compound, so if you late two months, three months, doesn't matter. There is no compounding interest payment like the 5% that we're talking about with the banks. And none of it goes to our, we don't profit from it, in fact, I will say, I will share this with the crowd, it costs us more than $50. We haven't changed it, we've never have. Non-recourse commitment, uh, this is a big one. When somebody is actually in default, doesn't make their monthly payment for months, they're in default. What happens in a, a, a traditional sense? You, you're, anybody in their right mind would say, look, it doesn't seem like this is working out. You know, you, you're not meeting your obligation to buy me out, it's been six months, uh, we can work on some kind of an arrangement to get you back, but if that doesn't work, we're gonna have to liquidate, we're gonna have to just say, hey, let's sell the asset between us that we helped you facilitate the purchase of. Conventionally speaking, what do they do? It's a traditional foreclosure. After six months worth of compounding interest payments on the late fee, so you're already in a deeper hole with them financially, but when they actually do foreclose, they sell the property, and if they don't recoup what they're owed, what happens? They come after you. It's called recourse. In 2007, 2008, the number of recourse cases in the United States skyrocketed. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal about the deficiency judgment issues issued on Floridians, and they were in the hundreds of thousands, where people went in and said, the value of my property sank. <laughs> I couldn't make the payments anymore, so there was nothing. So I literally walked to the bank, dropped off my keys, and got in a car and left the state, went to Georgia to find employment, and six months later, sheriff's knocking on my door, I have a deficiency judgment, and it said, hey, you know that house that you bought for 200,000 with the bank? You know how you had $10,000 equity and they, you owed them 190? Well, with your late fees and everything, you owed them 200. Oh, and also when they sold it, it sold for 150. So you know what you owe them? $50,000, cough it up. So we, most people are like, cough up what? I have nothing. I, I gave them the keys. I started my life over. No, no, the deficiency judgment says that we can confiscate your car, your bank accounts, your savings, and even go after your wages. That's the long hand, the long arm of the bank and recourse laws. If you're in a state that actually prohibits it, count yourselves lucky, but there's not a lot of states that prohibit it. The majority of states allow it. For guidance as contract, it's strictly prohibited. We cannot do that because we didn't engage in a loan. There was no lending of money. We're co-owning. And what happens when you co-own a property and it sells for 150? In our case, that's it. The loss is already baked in. We walk away. Even though we, our loss was $40,000. We walk away. That's why non-recourse matters. Now, here's the most interesting part about shared risk. I, I put in there shared risk because it actually comes into, into uh, greater uh, 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 importance in two scenarios. There's a scenario called eminent domain. Maybe some of you have heard of eminent domain, maybe not. And then another one is um, natural disasters. So in those two cases, natural disaster of eminent domain, we don't have a, a, we don't have anybody to blame with the, with the agreement going south. Uh, I'll explain. Can we control the weather? We cannot. Natural disasters, not in our hands. So if something happens to the house that's completely disarrayed, so the complete loss, as they call it, the, the insurance proceeds are gonna come in the mail. But what if the insurance proceeds are $150,000 when the house is actually 200? And our percentage of ownership, our percentage of ownership at the time 
was 90-10. I'll tell you what the bank does. They'll take that 150 and they'll say, give us the rest, please, because you owe it to us. Guidance will take the 150, divide it up 90-10, and then we walk away. So it is a true sharing of the loss based on the percentage of ownership because no one was at fault in that transaction. Same thing with eminent domain. Eminent domain, I mentioned it, it's if the government decides it's a, it's a great idea to put a highway, a school, a fire station, a police station, something for the greater good in the area where your home sits. And it happens over time. And so if that happens, you are faced with, okay, I, need, I have no choice, I need to vacate. The government will pay me exactly what I believe my house is worth today. But if you're during in, uh, a recession of sorts and the value goes down, those proceeds may be less. And if those proceeds are less, we treat it exactly how we tr would treat a natural disaster. We would divvy up the loss according to the percentage of ownership at the time. If the value is higher, some people would say, whoa, you can take a you know, uh, percentage of the value increase. Wouldn't you, guidance? The answer is no. Remember I said at the very beginning, who chooses the house? You choose the house. So when a customer chooses their location, their house, all the appreciating value of that property is going to go straight into the pockets of our co-owners. Why? The consumer. Because this is not a shirakat al-aqad. This is a shirakat al-milk. That's the big difference that I want to cover. I know you see no prepayment penalty. It's ludicrous to say that um, you, pay me, you pay me everything that you owe me early and I'm going to penalize you. This used to happen and it's starting to come back in the mortgage, in the, in the Western banking industry. In 2003, 2004, prepayment penalties were there. In the first six to 12 months, if you repaid the loan to the bank, they actually charge you a penalty to do that. We, we've, you can buy us out anytime. There's no penalty to buy, you, to buy us out. Um, I'm going to dispel two myths, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Or we may play a video if the technician uh, can figure this out. Um, the two myths are, the first, Freddie Mac. I mentioned it at the beginning. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. I'll be honest with you guys. 20 plus years ago, I didn't know what Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae did. The public doesn't necessarily understand the intricacies of the housing structure in the United States. But I'm, I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna try to describe it so everybody can understand it. Congress, the US Congress chartered Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. They are chartered by Congress as what they're called a GSC, a government sponsored entity to provide liquidity in our housing industry, in our housing market. Their job is to buy mortgages on the secondary market, pool them, and sell them as mortgage-backed securities to global international investors. That's their job. The reason why they were formed is because the US government believed, and it's very true today, that the housing industry drives all other industries, and that we need to support the housing industry. How do you support the housing industry if you're a Fed? You say, well, liquidity is an issue. The banks in their deposits, remember how I mentioned the banks have deposits and they issue loans off of those deposits? They don't have enough money to help provide loans on riba to the public. So they need to figure out how to make sure there's enough liquidity in the industry to keep housing going. Because if somebody buys a house, they're likely gonna spend money on what? Maintaining that home, right? Think about it, the plumber, the electrician, the uh, renovator, um, the taxes that are generated from that home purchase. It generates a strong economy. So they were thinking, okay, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, go in, buy these mortgages, buy them, have the banks sell you their mortgages, and then pool them, because they generate what? They generate revenue from what though? The, from the interest payments made on a loan, and sell that revenue to investors and the institutional investor, the global institutional investors, I'll give you an example. Germany's um, teachers union fund, pension fund. What do you believe they invest their money? As the Germ German teachers invest in their pension funds for when they retire, the pension fund managers look at a an array of, of actual uh, 
stocks, mutual funds, whatever, to invest that money. One of the strongest investment for any of these global institutional investors is the US mortgage-backed security. It's dependable, it's stable, it's long-term. So they buy them. Now we had a grand idea. We went out to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in 1999, 2000 and said, look, you buy, you buy, you don't loan money, you're not a lending institution, but you buy these mortgages. Well, what about, would you be interested in buying Mushara Kamotanakasa structured mortgages that don't generate debt, uh, revenue on debt, but they generate utilization fees because we're gonna have customers pay us for utilizing our portion of the property. I know it sounds different, that took about three years and tons of legal fees for them to understand, and we were very fortunate, alhamdulillah, at the time, there was actually someone in the general counsel of Freddie Mac that looked at our program and said, yeah, I understand that riba, Muslims can't partake in it, we need to figure out a way that we can work with this institution because that's allowing Muslims to buy homes. And through this process, we were able, alhamdulillah, to convince Freddie Mac to buy for the first time Musharaka Mutanakasa structured mortgages, pool those mortgages and sell them to investors who have no idea that they're actually receiving funds that are halal. So that was a big breakthrough for us and we're proud of this and I think every Muslim should be. Um, so the point is Freddie Mac is not a bank. They are not a lender. They act as an investor. And they establish, invest one thing they do establish, and it's, it's actually very good, they establish investor grade guidelines. So the trade off for them was okay, follow our guidelines. What are, the, what are your guidelines for that? Do not uh, engage in mortgages with individuals who have credit scores less than 620. You say, why? You say, well, because traditionally speaking, the studies have shown those folks aren't ready yet. They need to increase their accountability. It's an accountability score, financial accountability. During the Prophet's time, وسلم, people asked about other people before they did business with them. That was the credit score back then. Today is quantified. It's quantified based on your activity in the past. So we understood that. Oh, and you know, make sure that the property is valued at the time. You absolutely will make sure the property is valued at the time. So they have guidelines, and we follow them. But they are not a bank and they are not a lender. Neither is they. Some of you may have heard of our relationship with this institution called U.S. Bank. We're not affiliated with them. They don't own a share of guidance. We don't own a share of theirs. We use them as a vendor, and here's how it works. U.S. Bank, they have a servicing division. I don't know if you've heard this term before. Servicing divisions, all they do, a servicing company, is an administrative company that helps mortgage companies handle the collections of payments. As a business, I'm taking you deep down the business models of the mortgage industry. Uh, uh, you have to have a collections department, as I mentioned earlier. You have to have a department that not just does that, but actually sends out monthly statements and collects the monthly uh, uh, payments that are made and gives customers access to a, a portal where they can check all. So you can either do it in-house, which will cost you, or you can hire a group to do it. The best group in the nation today is a division of this institution called U.S. Bank. They do it for mortgage companies around the country. So we reached out to them and said, would you mind servicing, being our servicing administrator, we'll pay you your fees to do the job. That's our relationship with them. Um, they are not affiliated with us. Uh, they're not a party to Musharika. They are essentially a vendor. So I had to fly out to Kentucky to meet with their uh, service and division agents at one point and do a training. And I did something similar to this to their folks. They all stood up, none of them was Muslim, by the way, and I said, how many of you have ever met a Muslim? And they, they said to me, uh, uh, by a show of hands, that no one's met a Muslim before. And I said, you can always raise your hands now you've met me. Um, and here's our program. So please, when you're speaking to our customers, you have your scripts, you have what we send them, what they're obligated for, nothing changes, of course, but do not use loan because you're mischaracterizing our contract. Can't use that. Do not use borrower. These are not borrowers. You're mischaracterizing them legally. We went through all that training and eventually I had people come up and say, do you only offer this to Muslims or can we uh, 
sense that we, we finance everybody. So that was kind of a, uh, a nice way to end that. But um, I, I promised that I would uh, tell you a little bit about some specials and tools that we have. Um, we have an online app where you can apply and essentially get uh, fast tracked through your pre-approval process. You want to be pre-approved for financing. You absolutely want to be the first step before going out and searching for homes or utilizing a realtor is get pre-approved. We actually have um, for qualified buyers, down payment assistance programs. Based on your county zip code, depending on your median income and how it compares to the actual median income of the, uh, the community you live in, you, you may be eligible for up to $2,500 per year down payment. So that's something you might want to ask any of our county executives to look into. All right, listen, we're going to kick off the QA. And before we do, I'm going to introduce my buddy. Her me. Domicilio. So What does home mean to you? Home is hope, dreams, security, family, freedom, future. Is home in your future? Guidance is here to help bring you home. Achieve the dream of home ownership without compromising your faith. We've helped over 30,000 families finance their homes in the halal way. That's $8 billion provided over the last 20 years and over $2 million back to the community through sponsorships aligned with our core values and principles. We are Guidance Residential, the number one U.S. Islamic home financing provider. And before we go, I'm going to introduce my colleague here. This is Nabeed Ali. Nabeed is one of our uh, regional managers. We have seven in the country. And he handles our, the, the following states. Illinois, uh, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, Indiana, and Minnesota. So if you're in any one of those states, he's the gentleman we want to talk to all of for more details about financing in those states. So let me start with, I see a gentleman who put his hand up first, and then I'm going to come to you second. Yes. I guess my question is, uh, how uh, is the uh, utilization fee determined? Is that determined by you? Is it a negotiation? What, what, what Great the question. Uh, the gentleman asked, how is our utilization fee determined? So when we went down this path, we asked the question to the Sharia Supervisory Board members, is, okay, when we're thinking about utilization, what should we charge? And they laughed. I'll be honest, they actually laughed at us and said, that's not a Sharia question. You can charge whatever you want. It's like the halal uh, butcher saying, what should I charge, right? And they said, listen, but we'll give you some advice. Um, you want to be competitive, number one. And so there was some ideas flowing at the time. Maybe we charge for the utilization of the portion of the property we don't yet own, but you're using. Maybe we charge that a percentage of the rent that would be uh, appropriate for that type of home. That was one idea that was actually floated at the time. Problem was, that's not scalable because rental rates fluctuate house by house, block by block, city by city. In the same block, a house could have a better kitchen or whatever, and they could rent for more. And secondly, rent can sometimes be higher in, in cost. So that's not apples to apples. So one of the Sharia board members mentioned this, called benchmarking, and the, um, the approval of benchmarking in semi finance. Benchmarking says, you can benchmark against the, the cost of whatever is being offered there in the conventional world to be competitive. So no different than if you're benchmarking against you know, um, non-halal meats, you can benchmark against what it costs to take out a loan on interest in a bank. Whatever that cost is, you can pay yourself to that to be competitive. And so our approach was to literally look at this and say, okay, there's a quantitative uh, assessment being done here. We own a $100,000 property, let's say, uh, $90,000, right, in the beginning. So we'll benchmark against the 90 through a, a rate. A rate that we'll peg against whatever's out there today. That's how we structure our pricing model according to the Sharia board, of course. Completely okay, completely permissible, and most importantly, competitive. So we benchmark. So if today's rates are, I don't know, 
five and a half, you'll finally you'll you'll likely find us at five and a half, and that would be a utilization payment each month. Great question. Though. Yes. Um, my question is: Say um, I'm getting a house that's like hundred thousand dollars, and we go into a ten percent, nine percent relationship. I will put in my share of ten thousand dollars because I have the money to I work. Where does Scottish guys actually get the ninety percent? Um, or if it's a million dollar home, where do you guys get yeah. the $900,000 from? Yeah, great question. So, uh, no, the simple, uh, the question was, where do we get on a $100,000 property, whatever, if it's 90, 10, and we're bringing 90% of the value, that would be $90,000, where do we get our money? Well, first and foremost, first it's our money that we work with. But, remember what I mentioned about our investors, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, keeping li liquidity in the market? So our objective is to then ensure that that Mujaraka structured mortgage is sold to them. One thing that they look at is, did you meet our guideline criteria? That way we'll, we'll buy that mortgage from you. We'll buy that Mujaraka from you. So our guidelines dictate essentially the transaction. Once that happens, we turn around and sell that Mujaraka to us as a structured mortgage to Freddie Mac with the following conditions. Though that contract does not change. Not a letter of that contract changes throughout the 30 years if it's a 30-year agreement, right? That's one. Number two, we retain, we retain the LLC relationship with our customer and the interactive relationship throughout the term of the contract. So they're essentially what you would call in today's term a silent investor. That's really their role, to become a silent investor for us. And I was going to say this earlier, but I thought people would find it if somebody walks up to us tomorrow, a Muslim, and says, we have $2 billion. We'd love to buy Musharraq with enough structured, structured mortgages and, and have some of that revenue from utilization. We'd be in talks. But the, 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 the simple challenge is, we don't have those type of level investors at that scale. That's why Freddie and Fannie were created to begin with. Good question. In the back. Yeah, yes. The uh, finding balance is that the only way guidance makes money, or is there a fee on top of that? Yeah, the way we make money is from our utilization fee. Uh, we have what's called an origination fee in the beginning that's to offset a lot of the cost of processing the entire uh, uh, application. So, typically, in a home uh, uh, financing transaction, there's like 20 to 30 days of work that takes place to get you to that settlement, working with attorneys. There's all kinds of third-party fees, of course, but we make our revenue essentially from the utilization. Okay, follow-up question. And we I'll have, come to next. We have a few friends that tried guidance out and quit. It's too personal for them to share why, so I want to ask you, what are some reasons people don't go through with guidance? What are some of the reasons people don't go through guidance? I, I Honestly, to be frank, the number one reason that I've seen in the last 19, 20 years is a lack of understanding, a, a, a lack of true understanding about what we just discussed today. Um, I would say 99.9% .9 that I came across is this, and um, it's this difficult, complex financial arrangement that we spent three and a, three and a half years, tens of millions of dollars, to make sure it's authentic, it's structured properly, it functions in a competitive manner, and so on and so forth. And we're trying to explain it to folks in, in a matter of minutes, hours sometimes, they go through the process of the application I'm referring to, the application. They go through the 20, 30 days until closing, and then they come back and have questions. And to me, that's a tragedy. I, I remember holding a customer appreciation lunch once. This was in 2005. We're small enough that we can able to fit people in and talk to them. And many of them raised their hand and asked these questions. These are folks that closed with us. Asked questions, and I was appalled, and I said, you didn't know the answer to that question before you closed with us. And they said, no, because we trusted the shiuch, uh, uh, one of them being uh, the scholars. Uh, the, 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 uh, one, one gentleman said, anything that Sheikh Mufti Muhammad Taqarakmani says is halal, I go with it. And I said, well, that's great, but I want you to know the details. I want you to know how what Sheikh Muhammad Taqarakmani deemed permissible about our contract and helped it become uh, permissible, so you can explain it to friends and family and not have any, you know, uh, questions floating in your mind. So I think a lot of folks, honestly, uh, to be frank, 
it's not enough knowledge and understanding of the structure, or, and I'll be frank, it could be bad interaction, customer service interactions, with an, an account executive. Uh, and that is shameful on us. And I, I personally take that very seriously in terms of communication, customer service. It, it reigns true no matter what you're providing, right? Whether you're selling halal pizza or, or, or Islamic finance, you, you need to make sure service is there. And I, you had your hand up, so I promise to go to you next. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's uh, guidance for finance, rental properties, also which is practically as Great question. We do. Uh, does guidance finance rental properties in addition to primary residence? Yes. We finance primary residence. We find secondary homes, we find investment properties. The one thing that we won't cross over to, and we have not, is commercial designated properties. Yes, and then I'll come to you after. Uh, I want to first thank you guys for coming out here to Chicago. Uh, I know the room is small, we didn't get a lot of people. I liked your presentation last night, and I wanted to come with this. Um, I'm still going to be a long way to only point more people to buy my first home. But in my way, before this game, my personal was hoping you can offer uh, student loans for things of that nature, or any the car loans, etc. Great question. Uh, do we offer anything? Do we offer student uh, education financing or automobile financing? So, two years ago, we reconvened our product development committee, which is the committee that went into action in, uh, 20 years ago for three years. And um, while I won't there's not going to be any announcement today about anything coming or anything of that nature, so we don't currently have anything outside of what I described today for res for retail finance. Uh, uh, that could change very much so in 2023. So I'll say that. You had a question, sir. And then I'll come to you back. I, I, I want to echo that gentleman's uh, thoughts that he had about your presentation. It was, it was awesome. I've Thank you. had a market through guidance. And I walked away from one other mortgage through guidance. But I have my question is that uh, the people that I've dealt with guidance have been excellent, nothing but excellent. So my question, and I live in Ohio, so I'm sure you you know who the yes. Ohio representative is. Other than you, it wasn't you, but it was somebody else. But excellent gentleman, and he has I'm sure he brings a lot of business in the Columbus area because that's where he lives. And, and I don't want to take his name. But my question is. Uh, you're selling this to Freddie Mac, but you're not controlling who Freddie Mac is selling those mortgages to, correct? Right, correct. You don't have that control. No, we do not have that control. They can sell it to, you know, pension funds, or you name it. Uh, uh, no, but that can, they can also sell it to a non, you know, like, not halal companies, for example. Well, any, anybody who's buying mortgage-backed securities, and this is kind of going deeper, deeper into, the, into kind of the, the secondary financial industry, um, they're typically major funds, major, major fund holders. Because you're not gonna buy five million of this stuff. You're gonna buy it at 50 million or above, 100 million or above. Uh, uh, it's a security, think of it, you're buying a security and you're buying it at the 50, 100, 250 million dollar level. So um, who buys it and who reaps the reward? It's not in our control whatsoever. Um, but I always think, you know what? It doesn't matter to me who buys it. First of all, it's not a sure issue by any means, right? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a concern of our team, but I always feel like people are going to be profiting off of halal investments and they don't even know it. And tomorrow, as we grow, as Islamic finance grows, pure Islamic finance, true Islamic finance, um, people are going to recognize this benefit, and kind of like the, the people who came to me in Kentucky and said, can we finance for you? Uh, it opens people's eyes. Uh, ultimately, people will start asking the question, where, you know, where, and I'll share a goal that guidance has. We want to get to a size that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae brand our security. So it, it becomes a branded U.S. mortgage-backed security. So the brand would be a, a, a purely halal um, uh, secondary market uh, security, market MBS, mortgage backed security. So uh, we're not there yet. We need to get to that size for them to be able to brand it. And when you brand something then at that level and it shows performance, because I'll be honest, our mortgages perform much better than the average mortgage out in the, out in the industry. 
It certainly does, because we take on a lot more risk. We're much more serious about the transaction. We're not just going through it for the sake of going through it. And Muslims tend to pay. <laughs> Muslims tend to actually meet their obligations. And so we've seen that, and I think it could be something that could be marketed down the road, but yeah, uh, today um, it's not something that we control. It's not something that's branded. It's kind of a, a, a silent baraka that's going out to some people who are investing in this. You had a question, and then I'll come back to you. Sure. First, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my question centers on the Islamic principle of la da 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 da. So, Sharia compliance in a bad economy, as a in, in this contract between a homeowner being a minority owner and God is being the majority owner, bad economy, a hundred thousand dollar home comes down to fifty. The homeowner contributes that 20%. Uh, non recourse means guidance assumes the loss. So, are we now into the la de la la portion where guidance loses more than they should into this shared risk? Should be the case. Uh, opposite side is in a good economy, the $100,000 home becomes a $500,000 home. In a no penalty prepayment, as an example, uh, does the does guidance own or gets the, the percentage of the equity of the five hundred thousand dollar home versus just the portion that actually still is owed? I'm going to cover the last part of your question first. The second thing. So I mentioned earlier. This is I, and, and I apologize if maybe you weren't here, but we talked about uh, the types of mushrikas that we uh, that Islam and there's many, uh, but I put a few on the board. Shiraka al aqid everything you just said applies to Shiraka al aqid Yes. Things go down, things go up. You're sharing in what? You're sharing in the loss, the, the, the gain, uh, regardless of the event. Meaning the, the event that caused liquidation. Okay? Shiraka al milik does not work that way. Shiraka al milik works a little bit differently. Right? Shiraka al milik says we are partnering for, for ownership to facilitate ultimate sole ownership because the partnership is for co-ownership in the beginning. And in this case, I mentioned in the latter uh, question, buy a house of 100,000, uh, uh, let's say it's a 30 year mortgage, it moves up to 500,000 in the, let's just say the fifth year. Um, and the customer says, oh, this is great. I have equity now of 400, Thousand plus, let's say, ten thousand that I put in, into the ownership. He sells at that point. All of the appreciating value of that home is that customer's. All of it. Um, so, this is the beauty of Shirak et and why our scholars chose Shirak et in the U.S. housing market. Um, because there's a, there's there's a value to owning property in the United States. We want to help create a bridge to getting people there without taking away the value, without diminishing that value. Um, and so guidance at that time would be at 90, let's say 90. So 90,000 is all eventually. If it's less at the time, it would be less. It's at the original value. Um, the first part of your question then would be the same. So if the customer decided to sell, decided to sell early and in a time where the value somehow went from 100 to 50, Guidance would take, in that 90-10, guidance would take a $40,000 loss. The customer takes a $10,000 loss. That's, that's the way it would work. So, but would guidance have to approve the sale? Would, would guidance have, have to approve that sale? So, in a down market? Yeah, so essentially in a down market, you're looking at uh, a request to short sale. Short sale the property. So they, the customer would put in a request. But ultimately, the figures ultimately work out exactly the same. Because if they decide, um, I'm going to short sell it, uh, we'd have to approve the short sale, um, which is typical business activities anyway. If they decide, well, I'm not going to make the payments, and if you don't allow me to short sell it, the same outcome ends up happening, because we would have to sell it. Because we wouldn't want to be in a contract where there's default, meaning the customer decided not to make payments anymore. But the one thing that we won't do is have recourse. I mean, we're talking about the worst case scenarios and customers taking advantage of our organization. And I hate putting that out there, but 
Yeah, we wouldn't have recourse over that 40,000. I was thinking if I wanted to move, I was moving out for whatever job reasons in the down market and I need to sell that. Yeah. Then, you know. Can rent it. Yeah, well, our solution during this uh, short sale uh, application, right? So you're, you're applying for short sale. That would be part of the negotiations of our discussions. Is uh, I have to, I have to. We would add, we'd come back and say, wait for the market to come back up. And we're talking about drastic 50% loss in value, which is, which is rare in the US economy, right? This is why, I mean, this program of ours may not work very well in other markets around the world, but it works well in the US. You had a question, I want to get to your question, now. I'll come to yours, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, before, before, so this gentleman has an end up, so I'll come to you second and third. I'm sorry, guys. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, my first part is about uh, I've heard arguments saying that RIBA is more usury, more like loan truck type, where you can't get back to do like sell your house or sell like a family member or something like that. And that interest rates controlled in the US, and um, uh, it, especially if you lower the percentage rate, doesn't match inflation. So I just wanted to get one of your thoughts on that, your response to that. And my second question is what is the difference between your organization and other similar uh, financing? Great. So the question was: Some people have this argument about usury and and riba. They're, two, they're saying they're two different things, um, and usury and interest are two different things. And um, uh, and how? Listen, if uh, really, if you're overcharging, it's usury, and that's what's really prohibited. But if you're charging a little bit, it's okay, interest is okay. Um, I'm reminded by a, a very, very profound talk that I heard uh, uh, by some scholars about this topic. And this, this was deception at its, at its height. I'll explain why. The, uh, the King of England, who's supposed to be, and this is where it, it, it began there, I want you to know it began in England. The King of England, uh, at the time, he is sort of, remember at the time the kings were sort of the extension of the Holy Roman Church, and they were protectors of it, right? And they were supposed to keep that, uh, that orthodox belief in usury, in don't lend money at interest. I showed it to you guys, it was in Leviticus and Exodus, right, in the Old Testament. Well, at one point, the King of England had so many things going on all over the world, where he had troops here, troops there, occupational forces all over, and he's running out of money. And the idea at the time was, well, we need to keep our empire going, and I have no other way to fund it except to look at our people, look at those who believe in the King. And Wordsmith, wordsmith, um, usury, which was return on the definition, return on money lent into interest. And the way he did it was this way. He said, if we want to keep our great empire alive, and the king is who he is, right? The king is the, is the, is the protector. Of our, of our faith, we will have to loan money out to people at, at interest, this is an internal discussion, but we're going to call it, um, uh, uh, there's, we're, we're going to distinguish it from usury, this is the first time we begin the distinction, and we're going to say we're lending in the interest of the king. We're lending in the interest of the crown and the Roman Catholic Church. So it became the king's interest is okay. The king's interest is our interest, it's okay. But it's not, usually it's not okay. This began, this proliferation of lending at interest began to become okay if it's not useless. Go back, if we go back to the quotes from the Old Testament and the Quran, it didn't say. Allah allows a little bit of riba, but a lot of riba, I will wage war on you. My, the, 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 a prophet and I will wage war on you. 
It's a penny of interest. So lending and borrowing at, at interest is forbidden regardless of the amount. So those who introduce usury as sort of an okay, don't be using this, right? Don't be using this back in those days, man. Don't lend at interest, period. But this is a fascinating topic that nobody wants to talk about. And in fact, the, 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 the Bank of England and, and the way money was then fabricated uh, as paper uh, all started there. Uh, second question, and I'll get to yours, I'm sorry. Second question is how are we different from our competitors? Well, we have a number of competitors that are just simply subsidiaries of banks. Let's call it what it is. Uh, two major banks out there that decided that, not major, I should say, regional banks that wanted to grow, decided, I, we like this, we can make a little money here. Uh, so they, they, they launched a, subsi a subsidiary, each one of them, and they basically said, hey, let's just give it the title of Slavic, and everything will be okay. Um, what did they do? They bought a product off the shelf from someone who was selling the product, meaning selling the structure of a product, not a chef, not a scholar, and they started peddling this to the American Muslim public. Unfortunately, uh, in some cases, we've had leaders who are not very knowledgeable in the fit of Islamic financial transaction laws to the extent that some of these uh, renowned scholars are, fall for that and put their name up to it, and now it's out there. Look at the fine print, look at what they're selling, and you'll understand. Some are selling murabaha, which has been deemed to be not halal in the way it's structured in the US. And we were told never to structure a murabaha. And some are now, one of them is selling now a mushaharika structure that actually says, because they're, they are owned by a bank and they cannot do musharikas, one of them actually states, in the event of natural disaster and, and, and loss, total loss, um, the bank will, well, they don't say bank because they they don't want to tip you off, but the institution will uh, seek to divide the, the, uh, the proceeds equally, and then the fine print says, but first, the bank gets its share. <laughs> Meaning, Meaning, wait a minute, it's like you fooled me. I, I read the contract, and I'll be honest with you, I was fooled because I, at first I was like, they're sharing? They're not, they can't. Number one, the reason why they can't is because if you're a subsidiary bank, you're managed by the bank and bank rules state in the US that you cannot co own with your customers. You're prohibited from co owning with customers as a US bank. So that, that's a new point to begin with. What they said to you is different. Their marketing, the documents say it. So I urge you to read the documents carefully and ask about these questions. But I will tell you today, it, no other institution has uh, uh, our structure. The one you mentioned, what was it called? Ansar. Ansar. They have a co-op. Yeah, I'm not familiar too much with Ansar, but I would imagine if it's a co-op structure, that there's probably a line that will take about 10 years for them to be able to fulfill the needs of Muslims. Meaning, they don't have enough of the funds, they haven't established a scalable model like we have. They haven't gotten approval by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to buy whatever it is they're structuring. That's, that's my guess. Because uh, we looked at co-ops, they're just not scalable. Yes, sir, sir uh, I'll, yours and then I'll come to you next. So let's say the profit, the value of the property increased drastically down the road and in the market. Will buyers be willing to renegotiate the structure, the LLC structure, the refinance? I'm talking about the refinance. Yeah, yeah, if you want to refinance, let's say $100,000 what we started at, 90, 10, value up to 400, or like this gentleman said, 500, and you wanted to access, that's now equity, right? So you can, you can actually renegotiate, call it refinance, and we, you can take cash out from your equity, either the 10 that you already have in there from when we first engaged, or the additional value, because what we'll do in a refinance is we'll actually create a new valuation on the property. So yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, okay, well, you and then you're next, Thomas. Two points, I just want to make sure that I understood you correctly. You said if there is a short sale for the value most, uh, the property most in value, like it's 100,000 to begin with, and for whatever reason, ended up being sold for 60,000, and there is a loss. You mentioned that guidance will share the, the loss with the, with the buyer, am I correct? Yeah, in that scenario, at $100,000, I want you to think about the, the, the economics. $100,000 property, you're saying it went down to 60? Yes. 
Yeah. And we had 90 10. What is our loss? So it's 30. Yeah. What is your loss? 10. Okay. So a conventional bank will not stop there. They'll come back after their 30. It's, the it's called recourse. And, yeah. and potentially whatever late fees and, 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 and compounded interest that might be baked in. Okay, now we want to flip the equation. Suppose the property, the, 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 the buyer decided to sell it and it doubled in value. We bought it for 100 and he 200. has a chance to sell it for 200. Yes. Are you just like with the same concept? Are you sharing with the profit with him or no? no. And why not? No, okay. I'll, I'll repeat. And I'm sorry. That's another, sorry. That's another point. Of the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, maybe, maybe that's, and, and, and just for the crowd, I, I apologize for having to go through this a couple of times. I, I put a slide up there at the very beginning, and it was the type of mutraka we're using is not a shirakat al aqid. A shirakat al aqid is a joint, co um, a joint partnership for venture. Venture. So, what is a venture? A venture says, we're in it to make money from what? Potential. Right? Potential, whatever that potential is. This is not that type of mushraka. That's why we do not share in the appreciating value of the property. It's all yours. The Sharia Supervisory Report that is, is, is today still in existence, back in those days said, you should not engage in an Islamic financial transaction that actually disadvantages Muslims in the United States in the, in the area of, uh, of seeking real estate, seeking home ownership. Why? Because they know that values appreciate, that's wealth creation that you're not depriving them of. And so they used what we call shirakat al-milk. It's a diminishing partnership, not a partnership for venture. Shirakat al-milk structure. And after the session, if you want to come up, I'll, I'll help share where you can learn more about shirakat al-milk. But shirakat al-milk states, no, any appreciating value in, this is essentially made to transfer ownership over a specific period of time. That's all it's made for. Uh, okay. okay. I got that. I got that. I have to go to his question. question. Well, can I come back to you? Because this gentleman hasn't asked him. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much for all what you've done so far. And for me, I'm between the U.S. and Morocco. So I'm going to start with the first part, which is here in the U.S., then go back to Morocco. So you, you don't do the Murada thing. That's we not don't. part of what you do. No. So the Musharaka. Uh, let's take that 100. I'm 10. You're 90. Now that servicing fee that I'm going to be, how I'm going to accumulate my equity. So let's say the value of the rent is $1,000. I'm a 10% owner, and you're a 9% owner. Throughout the year, let's say the 10, 15, 20, 30, how do I accumulate my equity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the first part. Uh, the second part, which is about Morocco, in Morocco, I've never heard of you guys. I mean, what happens in Morocco, especially after the Islamic government took over, they were talking about Islamic products offered by conventional banks. So a Tijari offered something, uh, a different bank offers something with names that are different than the original banks, mm -hmm. but when you approach them, they do offer murabaha mainly, and let's say I buy with 100, and they set it up with their calculate at 300 or 200, it doesn't matter, even if after five years I decide to buy out, I will still have to pay the 200. Yeah. So, so I want to have the place that's uh, guidance in Morocco, and my Yeah, guidance. so in Morocco, um, the structures that were developed there are probably going to be different than the structures developed today. They're either going to fit under one of these three that I put up on the board. Uh, these. Murabaha, Musharaka, or They're going to be under one of these three, more than likely. So in Morocco, we worked with uh, the Bank Populaire, uh, which is the second largest bank there. We helped them with the conversion of some of their products to an Islamic financial structure and finance, uh, finance products. And, um, the other two, uh, I can't remember their names right now, the other two banks that I think worked with IDB and Qatar National Bank, uh, Qatar Islamic Bank. Um, so I, I, I don't know enough about those products that they rolled out, very likely Murabaha, because it fits within the economic system of Morocco. Um, you asked a question again about... How do I... This is the differentiator, Shirakat versus Shirakat al -Aqid. And your question is related to this. Um, right here, number three. So your monthly payment is uh, calculated either on a term of 30 years, what you, whatever you choose. We have 30 year, we have 15, we have 20. So let's say you choose 30, uh, just to keep it simple, 15, whatever you want. Whatever you choose, you choose. 
Your monthly payment for that term doesn't change. It's fixed. But what's happening in the monthly payment, there's two portions that equate to that, let's say, $1,000 a month. One portion is utilization, one is acquisition. So each month, a portion of that 1000 is going to acquire acquisition, acquire our share, reducing our ownership instantly, instantly. And the other portion is going to utilization. What is utilization? If, uh, if, essentially, it's, you're utilizing a portion of the property that I own, that I own. But if my ownership decreases, guess what happens? I can charge you the same, I have to charge you less and less and less every single month. And that's what's happening in the, in the, in the transaction. So every single month you're owning more, we're owning less, and you're getting charged less every single month for utilizing my portion of the property. And at any point, if you decided, for Sam or Gaffins, I just want to buy you out. <laughs> you may. I'm not buying this out. 